and your fashion design meets the metaverse, a live webinar from the Digital Fashion Group. We are not in Xanadu or even in the metaverse, but we are ready to discuss some ideas and concrete actions that are leading us to this new virtual future. Xanadu is a metaphor for opulence and idyllic place. What made us wonder, is the metaverse pure opulence or it's actually the promised land? Hello, I'm Lydia Pinay and I will moderate this panel today. Here with me is Teacher Hobbs from Brand New Vision, talking from Hong Kong. Good evening, Teacher. Thank you so much for staying up late for us. Relatively. <laughs> okay. And hello to Danny Loftus from This Outfit Does Not Exist, joining from London. Hi, Danny, and thank you for being with us. Hi, Olivia. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Thank you. To complete the table, I'm calling two of our founders of the Digital Fashion Group, Leslie Holden in Belgium. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Olivia. And Sean Charles in Portugal. Hello there. Well, hi, Olivia. And hello, Richard. And hello, Danny. Yes, hello, Richard. And hello, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> and hello, Leslie. <laughs> hello, Sean. <laughs> hello, all. And thank you all for being here to explore and share your knowledge together and with the audience, OK? For those who are watching, thank you so much for joining us. During the webinar, we'll be conducting three polls to get you to know how you feel about aspects of the metaverse. If you're the audience, okay, have any questions for the participants during the webinar, please post them in the Q&A session. Here, there's a window under your Zoom window and stay until the session at the end. We will answer the best way we can, okay? This session is being recorded, answered, and polls and Q&A interactions are anonymized, okay? So, starting with Richard. What is the metaverse and why is that so important for fashion? Uh, that's a good question to start. You know, what are we talking about? Um, I think the, the way I would best define it is um, not gaming. Um, it's open-ended. It's a digital version of a combination of real life and um, other elements that people can access but it's important that it's open-ended. And the beauty of what's happening now is with DAOs, De Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, which are allowing the concept of NFTs and digital asset ownership and all of these elements eventually to be completely transferable across multiple um, use cases. Now, the problem that that comes to at the moment is there is not a single metaverse. There are lots of different metaverses being built by lots of different companies. Some of them are owned by companies. Some of them are more on the decentralized area, but they all have multiple standards, multiple formats. And we're, we're quite some way away yet from having something where you can own something digitally and be able to utilize that. And in our case, we're talking about fashion, which comes down to wearability and be able to transport that across different uh, locations. So, I mean, we can talk about Snow Crash and we can talk about Philip K. Dick and we can talk about, you know, other, other people that are moving in different areas. But I think that's the way I would try and define it. Anything where eventually a digital asset can be easily transferred across multiple use cases, if that helps. Yes, very much. And Danny, uh, what would you say is the designer's place in the metaverse? Brilliant question, Livia. So around exactly what Richard said, the metaverse is not a game, but it is a virtual world. And I really see the digital designer's place as furthering and ensuring that we are immersed in, the, in that digital world. So the way that I perceive digital fashion, I see it uh, to have three distinct forms. So the first is what I would call physical digital fashion, which is a little bit of an oxymoron. And it's a digital fashion that comes in to inform the way that we produce physical garments. So the end garments are still physical clothes. The second is digital, so physical and digital combined. And that would be the digital fashion that can be worn on human beings. And the third is fully digital. So it's digital fashion that's sold direct to avatar. And when you look at the metaverse, I would say you're covering those, you're really covering the last two. So you're covering digital fashion and you're covering fully digital fashion. And if you look at the way that we consider fashion in the physical world, it allows us to shape our perceptions of ourselves when we're wearing garments, but also to shape others' perceptions of us. And so as we move into the metaverse, you have those functionalities that really, really enhanced. So 
it's not only assure, ensuring that you feel a certain way about yourself or others feel a certain way about you, but it's also immersing you in that virtual environment and defining the rules of interaction within that environment. And designers have a really unique place of starting to set those guidelines and allowing you to express yourself and allowing you to feel that you are participating in worlds that would otherwise be unfamiliar. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Leslie, even though this is controversial, but historically speaking, the fashion industry does not invest much in innovation and new technologies. The technology we are using today to create the metaverse was developed mainly by the gaming industry, as we were already talking about. This means that tools weren't exactly thought for fashion purposes. Uh, what does it mean for fashion designers? Yeah, it's a great question, Livia, and a big question. I'll try and bring it together in the best I can. Um, just please stop me if I'm waffling on too long, because it's a, it's a really interesting topic. It's very true that the fashion industry does not invest enough in innovation and new technologies, unlike the automotive industry, for example. Even although the fashion industry is primarily about newness and, and the new next best trend or fad it is, but it's really not very innovative. It's basically following the same business model as it's been for the last 30 odd years. And indeed, actually, the majority of fashion education is still teaching that formula. And you know, when we first started researching to develop our first course, Digital Fashion 101, we decided to reach out to nascent technology companies because we thought this is where it's happening and new things are happening with them. And there's two things that really surprised us. First of all, they weren't as joined up as we thought they might be. And, and secondly, this technology was being developed by fashion, for fashion, actually by people and companies who had no fashion experience. So um, they didn't really understand the complexities of the fashion value chain. Now that in itself, I think, isn't really necessarily a bad thing because to change or to shift from an old business model you really need to unpack it and, you know, together with fresh eyes, new ideas, new perspectives, you build something else. This industry is still the second biggest polluting industry on the planet. And every second somewhere in the world, a truckload of textile waste is dumped into landfill or incinerated. Only 1% of garments are recycled. And that's because technology isn't good enough yet, not being developed enough yet. Now, everything starts with education. And what you put in is what you get out. It's like an investment. And if you don't educate people to be innovative, you just get the same old. And, and then, then what do you get? Our mission in the Digital Fashion Group is to put the creative center stage in the fashion dialogue, empowered by a digital suite of appropriate technology which is designed specifically to ensure that that creative is the director of the product from ideation to product presentation. And there's no other people coming in and changing the ideas as they go along, like buyers or merchandisers or whatever. Sorry if you're a buyer or merchandiser out there. Fashion designers are historically taught to only understand the creative part of the value chain. So really don't have much understanding of what's happening further down the line. So one can actually say, I wouldn't really, but one could say that a reason for so much waste in the fashion industry could be bad or uninformed decisions at the creation stage. So I'm nearly done. <laughs> we need to put a focus on technology, helping to turn the ideation into sustainability reality, sustainable realities. Now, fashion merging with gaming, which you mentioned in the question, has been something on the cards for a number of years. And this opens up huge potential for fashion designers. You know, in the UK alone, there's 5,000, around 5,000 fashion design graduates each year with limited opportunities for employment. So, I see the metaverses opening up new marketplaces, new opportunities, new occupations for creatives in fashion who are desperately needing to ensure that there's less waste of fashion talent. 
And as you said, Livia, the technology we're using today to create the metaverse has, to, has, has been developed mainly by the gaming industry, which means that the tools weren't exactly thought for fashion purposes. And like, like the development of the metaverse itself, we do need to ensure the joined up, a joined up approach. Now, Epic Games knows this. We know that they know this because we've spoken to them. And, and of course, are already investing in fashion. And I see the metaverse as the beginning of a new definition of fashion, of fashion purpose, potentially powered by new partners. So it's a fantastic, it can be a fantastic opportunity for everybody. Absolutely. And so which skills designers should be trained to work in the metaverse? And what does education need to be uh, to do to make this happen? Okay, well, uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, setting aside the, the obvious need for the hard skills that you need to master the array of the digital tools required to create within the digital world, uh, some of which we, we had a bit of a glimpse with in the Gary James McQueen video clip from Unreal Engine in, in the start. Um, there's a fundamental need for designers and people to understand and embrace research analysis and selection as the basis of the fashion develop design development process that leads to design integrity at the end. And this for us is where the old traditional approach to design development has to merge with a new digital approach. A key focus for us, as Leslie's mentioned at the Digital Fashion Group is the mindset required for working as a digital fashion designer. Uh, this is not uh, apparent in everybody and it's not immediately found uh, when, you're, when you're learning to be a designer in, in the traditional sense in universities today, because it's not taught as, as Leslie uh, says. Um, that this is the focus of our flagship digital course, uh, Digital Fashion 101, um, where we are really focused on understanding what this world is, what's happening in the world, and how you can inhabit it. In addition to the digital mindset, fashion designers really have to be able to translate the emotions that arise when researching the zeitgeist and working with physical elements such as fabrics, textures, trimmings, etc. This is the connection to the physical. Learning to work with and blend the real with the unreal is the primary skill I think that fashion designers need to now learn and they have to transition to a new digital reality uh, for the future. As Leslie says, this is opportunity for everybody to grow into a new area, new opportunities, new occupations, new collaborations. It's really, really interesting what this digital reality is going to be. Embracing mixed reality as a design development concept tool and having outputs that are relevant for both the metaverse and the universe is also a key point for any digital fashion designer to address in the future. You need to be able to work between the two. Of course, you could be a designer or develop as a designer who wants to work entirely in the digital world, there isn't really anything wrong with that, of course, but um, I think within fashion and our perhaps our traditional approach to fashion, there really does need to be something physical in order to feel it. That, of course, is also something missing at the moment in, in the digital world, but there are great strides uh, being made to, to solve those issues. Um, and one aspect I see of the fashion in the metaverse that, that's not yet really discussed, um, but I think it, it's is going to be coming into discussion. Obviously the metaverse is so new, although it's been around a long time, it's new to many people. Um, it's really getting to grips with uh, what you're gonna do in it, how you're gonna deliver fashion, how you're gonna design in it, what are you gonna do, how are you gonna inhabit it? How do you collaborate with people? One of the things that there is an opportunity for it is in, in the metaverse, you can create unique assets so that there's only one of these unique assets. Now this is, very similar to the approach to bespoke tailoring or couture design in the past, where you create one collect one outfit, not collection, one outfit for a customer. Uh, this you can take the same approach. However, of course, digitally, you can create so many different um, iterations of a unique asset uh, that there's going to be a flood of creative output, a flood of creative NFTs at the end of the day uh, that can exist within the metaverse. Um, but bearing this in mind, one thing that I think needs discussing is that the sheer volume of this uh, for a fashion designer in the metaverse um, could become unimaginable in the traditional sense of how you deal with the pressure 
of creating and how you deal with the pressure of creating um, so many things. It's a bit like, you know, the, the large brand houses at the moment. Many designers have complained that they're under so much pressure to create, you know, 20, 30, 40 collections a year, uh, of course, with a team. Um, it's, it's a kind of relationship to that. Um, so I think mastering, uh, in, in the sense of the metaverse, in the sense of digital fashion design, mastering AI in the future is going to be something that's really interesting because the AI is something that can help alleviate this issue and remove the pressure from the designer. So, you know, this is, I think, something really important to look at as, as we move forward at, well, as the metaverse develops, it's going to develop on its own. Let's see what happens. Um, but from a skill and designer's point of view and style and aesthetics, uh, I have a quote that I I hold dear to me, um, and it's by Susie Menkes, who's an international fashion editor at large, um, and it's about design. And it isn't good because you like it, you like it because it's good. Uh, and this is a vital reference, I think, that everyone in the physical and virtual worlds have to have about the principles of good design, which remain the same and should be applied throughout both worlds. Precisely. And Danny, uh, which features do would you would be interesting to have on a tool specific for fashion designers to create for the metaverse? I really, really love this question, Livia. So you obviously have the basics, you know, you have the ability to create patterns, to create clothes through tools like Clo3D or Marvelous Designer. But I think what's very unique when you're moving into the metaverse and successfully being a designer are these two elements of utility and sovereignty. So when the NFT craze first started, something that I found relatively disagreeable was the fact that people were selling digital fashion that couldn't be worn. And to me, that's digital art, right? Because art is meant to be exhibited, but fashion is meant to be worn. And it's the same as kind of fashion photography when it's you know, a stunning dress, but you can't actually have it demonstrate its function. And so I think this idea of utility is absolutely core. Cool. And at the base, there's obviously this idea of being able to wear, whether it's your physical self or it's ported onto an in-game avatar. But what is so exciting about digital fashion in the metaverse is utility doesn't have to stop there. So as I said before, when you're wearing something in the physical world, it allows you to enhance your perception of yourself and also enhance the way that others perceive you. But unless it's a specialized form of equipment, you know, let's say a, a windbreaker jacket that protects you when you're mountain climbing or a jetpack, it doesn't provide you with a specific set of abilities that further that enhancement. Whereas the second you move into the digital realm, especially the fully digital realm, you can have that. So if you're designing fashion and game, you want to design something intimidating, you want to design something that would manifest as a black leather trench coat in the physical world, well, imagine if it's a black hole and it could suck people in. Imagine if you have a cat suit that gives you utility of becoming more agile. So this element of functionality is super exciting. So one of the things that I would envision is you as a fashion designer create a garment and a tool then created by game designers would suggest all of the functionalities you can input into it to move from this idea of the garment that alters perception of you to actually having that essential in-game functionality. So that's one that I think is really important. The second one is this idea of a united sovereign identity. And Richard referenced this, the fact that we're not in a state where there is one metaverse. And ultimately, what a metaverse is, it's not an in-game world. It's going to be a virtual layer on the top of our physical world where you can do everything from have a coffee with your friends to, you know, yes, engage in games or storylines, but also make a living. And yes, there'll be various components of that, such as let's say you want to go into Fortnite, you want to go into Roblox, you want to go into games, but ultimately it's one singular world. And at the moment, what you have with a lot of proto metaverses, so existing games, is that collections are limited to that game. So it operates as a walled garden. So if I'm a designer and I create a garment for Fortnite or I'm a consumer wearing a garment in Fortnite, I can't then wear that same garment in Animal Crossing. I can't then wear that same garment in, you know, Roblox or in Decentraland. And that's a massive inhibitor because as you move into the virtual world, you will have a singular identity or set of identities, 
And I think we all know how important what you wear is to solidifying that identity. And so if you have to hop around, that's not great. So one of the big developments is going to be in the next you know, five or 10 years, this interoperability. So what you wear in one game will be able to be worn in another. But what's very interesting is this will take very different forms. So if you look at, I would say, Unicode emojis is a good example. A smiley face on your Android is not going to look the same as a smiley face on your iPhone, but it should communicate the same things. And with fashion design, I can envision a tool where you can create the base garment. So let's say a red dress, but then you can see how it will look in all of the different virtual worlds and proto metaverses are going to import it into. So it will be a 240 by 240 pixelated square when you're moving into, um, into crypto voxels. And then it will be completely different in Fortnite. And it will allow a designer to create something that can be communally distributed, but also make sure that they retain the kind of authenticity of their work and that there isn't this divorce where you've created some stunning garment in one specific graphic format. And then the second you move into the other, it looks absolutely horrible and it doesn't fit anymore. So those are the two things that I would see as really essential in a future metaverse tool. I feel quite good futures in there. <laughs> and in what ways are traditional and uh, traditional analog design processes still important from the designer? And how will this continue when we are in, all in the metaverse? This question is for all of all the four of you. Can, can I just pick up on um, what uh, what Danny was saying there about the developing the interoperab interoperability? Sorry, it's late and standardization. I totally concur and totally agree that that's something that needs to be developed. Um, and it's something that we're actually researching at the moment, um, seeing how we can actually create something um, with which could develop exactly what you described. So you, you could own a token and within that token, as well as having a beautiful high res, high definition, collectible version of a, a product, because I think harking back again, the integrity of the design, the, the process, the attention to detail, these are still absolutely important, even if it's a virtual only product. People want to know that there's some effort expended, there's some, there's some creative input putting that product together. And it's not just a voxelated box because that's easy. They can, that everybody can do that within half an hour of accessing any of those types of programs. So I think it's really important that that element is there, but then having within that one token, the capabilities to take versions of the same article and move it into the different environments, because they, like, as Danny said, they're all looking slightly different. Um, so there has to be something that ties it all together. So actually it's, it's very early stages yet, and I probably shouldn't even be talking about it, but we've got a research group working on how we could potentially build a standard, which would allow that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a very good. That's a very good point, also, Richard. And mm -hmm. okay, so now I will I will back to you for this question about uh, the traditional and analog design process. Uh, how do you believe this will continue in the metaverse? You know, I one of the things. Sorry, let oh, me sorry. Carry on. Okay, so um, one of the things that um, I'm really questioning when I look at fashion in the metaverse, and um, Sean and I have discussed this as well. And um, how you're designing too um, is, is more towards um, an art form or an illustration than fashion. So I'm interested to understand the, the difference that perhaps how will the fashion industry actually be engaging with the metaverse? How will fashion designers who are designing clothes and going to be in the analog, but to a twin, will they be on the metaverse? So that's maybe I'm asking a question back to back to Danny and Richard as well, actually. How, how is it going to be? Because it's, it's all very early days, still, isn't it? Well, if I can go first and then Danny can come in after. So, um, there are various tools that people are using in the main. 
um, and predominantly it's CLO when it comes to apparel, CLO 3D, uh, which obviously came from Marvelous and then there's a reverse back into Marvelous, which is going on now, but there is no easy way of going from Marvelous or, or Clo into Unreal. So when you're talking about um, real-time material physics and the like, that's where it needs to be. So there is no easy path to go from one to the other. So it's still a very hands-on thing. So the skill sets that are needed are actually combined, merging those aspects from the um, design world that we know traditionally, which is now moving into using 3D design tools like CLO and Browseware and EFI, et cetera. Um, but then merging that with the capabilities that come with working with a game engine so that you can actually really enhance that. Because some of the stuff that we're working on at the moment is what I'm calling elevated NFT. So it's, it's still a beautiful piece of product um, and we're doing them with brands, but within that product itself, there's other elements that you can put in. You can tell stories within the garment. You can have interactive elements within the garment. You can open it up and find hidden things which you would not expect to exist. Like Danny was, you know, even a black hole. You know, th th there's so many opportunities with that gaming element that you can merge those two together. So I think if you're talking about what the skill sets would be, it would, you know, that, that finding people that can understand the intricacies and the process of true fashion design and convert and working with the, the 3D tools, but then being able to talk and engage with people from the gaming world and to be able to merge those two elements together. I think that's gonna be the, the, the real break. Because I can see, and I know for a fact that there will be much more fashion friendly metaverses coming in the next few years where you can take and wear really high, high definition interpretations of product and look pretty damn cool. Yeah, Danny, do you like to add something? I completely agree with Richard in terms of having the skill set that combines traditional design with an understanding of game engines and the spaces you design for. But I also think to go back to your original question around whether or not there's still a retained importance of traditional fashion design skills, I think it really relates back to what, you know, what's known in future technology as the uncanny valley. And so the uncanny valley often refers to the creation of humanoid avatars and when you make them look almost too realistic but then there's something just a little bit off which then as a human completely throws your perception and I think you can have exactly the same thing with fashion so you can create a garment in the metaverse and you can be a very very skilled digital creator but if you don't understand how it actually fits or how it moves it's going to actually be very jarring as a garment so in that way I think this understanding of patterns and this understanding of form is still absolutely integral and then I also think there really is no substitute for the creativity and the understanding of your craft that you have as a designer and how that can then move into the metaverse. You know, an understanding of tailoring, for example, or the understanding of form and then combining that with in-game functionalities. But you need that foundation in order to move into those more expressive, more futuristic modes. And therefore I think it's still absolutely integral to have a strong fashion design foundation in physical. Thank you, Danny. I, I think if I just uh, chip in, yes, exactly. And, and I talked before about, you know, the research element and the fabric element and tactile and, and emotion. And this is a, a vital um, training for a designer. I think what, it's what you grow up with when you want to, to be creative, when you want to be a designer. And whether you're digital or not, I think that's going to be the same. This is going to drive you as a child in, in your imagination uh, as you develop and lead you into the creative world. So these are vital traditional ways uh, that, that need to be embraced for, for working and moving into the metaverse, I think. Um, that said, of course, the, the fascinating future uh, possibly is with the you know the the tactile suits and when we can begin to feel things through digital interfaces um, and explore this is going to be a really interesting uh, have a really interesting impact on what you do with fabric for example or how you feel a form um, that's another another key point um, until you actually feel the form and and know that the uh, relationship of the form to yourself 
you don't really understand it. It's very difficult to understand. Of course, within the digital world, within the metaverse, a form can be anything and black holes, you know, whatever you name it, that's one of the beauties of it. Um, but when we're talking about developing fashion as the concept we're talking about uh, of, of expressive art and wearability, let's say, that people will want, um, I think it's still really important to understand these points that that you need to understand form and shape and volume and you need to know how things feel and how they flow. One of the things we're really interested in for, for research and development in the future is, is how you can enter into um, fashion draping where you create uh, on the stand in the traditional sense physically with fabric from a piece of fabric to garment at the end in a true, true couture sense of how this really can become mainstream in augmented virtual mixed reality, perhaps using Microsoft HoloLens or something like this, because that when that comes, when that ability is there in real time, and when you can see it on, on maybe even you know, the avatars that you've created, uh, this is gonna be a fascinating time for a designer. And bringing in all those research and development processes and putting them into the digital world this way, creating it in effectively in front of your eyes, um, digitally, not existing in front of you, but in existing in your eyes and your mind, and being a digital asset immediately is something that's going to be really, really interesting. Uh, and uh, you know, I could only wish that 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 was around when I when I went to art school and, and learned to be a designer. I, of course, I learned in a different way, but it would be fantastic today if you could do that. Um, really, really great. And bringing together these skills uh, are physical skills, digital skills, emotional skills. I think this is a key point. I agree. We are heading our final minutes. And before uh, the last round of questions for all of you, I would like to remember the audience, you can send us questions for the Q&A. Uh, here, there is a Q&A tool in Zoom, okay? I think the chat also works. In, in yeah. case the Q&A isn't working, I think the, the chat is open for everybody, yeah. Yes, please join us. So uh, recently Epic Games completed a funding round of $1 billion to work on a long-term vision for the metaverse. It means that Epic Games is expanding its universe to be the metaverse itself, or not. Some specialists uh, discuss the need for a unified protocol as Richard was talking about and is researching on. Uh, similar to what happened to internet with the internet itself 30 years ago, this will enable us and different parts of the metaverse to communicate as one. From a consumer perspective, how long will it take and what will it take for consumers to engage with the metaverse? Shall I throw some things out yeah. that one? Yeah, yeah. You should throw the first, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, we are just at the very beginning of just touching the most adventurous end consumers of digital products. Um, it's it's so tiny and so small in comparison to what it could be and what it will be. I firmly believe I wouldn't be doing this or, or I've been working on this project for th three years if I didn't believe that eventually we would all have digital wardrobes and we would be using those products in mul many different ways of working. But to actually, I mean, I'll, I'll go back when I first tried to buy crypto, Ethereum, to be able to engage with it. I gave up on any number of occasions because it, it, it was extremely difficult. It's a very time consuming and frustrating process. And it was never made easy because it was designed by Geeks for Geeks. Um, it's changing and it's becoming a little bit more accessible, but still the concept of having a, a wallet, a crypto wallet, which holds this stuff that doesn't exist to buy things that don't exist, um, is still very difficult for a lot of people to get their heads around. So I think, Part of what our job and other people that are operating in this area is to break down some of those barriers, to make things easier to understand, to demystify some of those processes and explain. And you know, part of what we're doing now with our, our recently revamped website is you know, going right back to basics. What is a crypto wallet? How do you use it? What are the risks? What are the scary points? Just be very, very transparent and open about it and talk about the different blockchain uh, protocols, the different things, and get people to understand it, hopefully in a very simple way. Um, so I think still it's going to take some time. Um, one of the processes that we're going to undertake is, is airdropping. So giving away NFTs. Um, it's, you know, it's a 
it's a it's a costly expense and we're looking at it very much as it's, it's a bit of marketing but it's also enabling people to go through the process of actually opening a wallet owning something but they actually don't have to buy ether they might have to when they want to trade it or they do something else with it but it gets them engaged in this world so that's one of our plans um, but i still think you know it's it's three five years but i i always said that um, a year, up to a year ago i was telling people that within three years everybody that's buying anything online will have at least one crypto wallet and will be purchasing things and not just fashion it will be music you'll be paying your bills you'll be you just have to look at axie infinity as a as an example of how now their um, what they call their slp which is part of their token structure is now being used in the Philippines to pay for groceries and living expenses. Um, yeah, I, I highly recommend anyone to look into Axi as not as a, an example of fashion, but how economies can evolve. And that will be what also creates opportunities in the fashion world. Yep. Can I ask a question, Richard, Danny? Um, NFTs. Uh, I mean, there's like suddenly NFTs are everywhere in the news, you know, it's like the last few months, you know, nobody had really heard about them, and suddenly, you know, they're everywhere. And I just heard on the radio this morning um, about how it was in a conversation about how NFTs um, were being used or could be used for people buying luxury products to move money around the world that you, you, know, you couldn't trace, you couldn't trace what they were doing with their money. Um, so that opens up a whole other question about the use of N NFTs. Um, is, it, is it going to be particularly aimed at the luxury market? Is so, that where it's going? Uh, I, th I think that's a great question and I can start answering that and obviously Richard, you know, come in. Um, so I actually began my career in blockchain and I began it you know, in 2018 where it was even more deregulated. I think at the moment with the NFTs, they're a costly endeavor, right? There's the cost of actually creating the good. Then there's the cost of minting it, which is when you put it on a specific blockchain. And then there are various gas fees, which are the fees of transferring it when you sell it. So obviously whenever you have barriers like that, it brings it into a higher echelon market. And equally the success of NFTs is built around these communities and Luxury brands obviously have large communities who can afford to spend money on these goods. However, as the way that blockchains are created changes, as the cost of developing 3D goods decreases, obviously NFTs, similarly, the cost of creating them will go down and therefore they can be democratized. And I think around the consumption question, and I actually wrote an explainer piece on this, and it was this idea of what does it actually mean that you buy when you buy digital fashion and how does this relate back to its value? And so I mapped it against a couple of things. So if you have a physical fashion garment, you can wear it where you like, you can wear it when you like, you can wear it how you like and you can make modifications to it. And with digital fashion now, it takes a couple of forms. So it takes the form of physical render where you're essentially paying for a photograph of yourself in a digital garment and that's in general one-off and part of the reason for that is the way that these garments are put on people is through using in-game engines and the process will take if you want to have it done well like four or five hours and so at the moment that's not scalable and therefore you're paying let's say for a photo in a dress where the dress would normally let's say cost you a thousand dollars you can have it on a photo of you for 30 minutes which is exciting but it's not quite ownership and what nft does which is very exciting is it gives you an ability to actually own a garment, so have it in your virtual wardrobe. You then can add in overlaid functionalities where you can wear it as many times as you like. You can also, with certain, what's known as fractionalized ownership, where you can, and there's a company called Async Art, just doing it in a really incredible way in the art world, where you buy a base layer. So the base layer would be a dress, but then you can buy layers on top of it, which add to the way that the dress looks. So you can modify it like you would a physical garment. And then you can also trade it or give it away in the way you would with a physical garment. So that's why NFTs are so important because they mean that you have ownership capabilities which resemble the ownership capabilities you'd have over a physical garment instead of it just being something which is used to enhance a photo. Um, and then there's also, you know, 
a ton of really exciting possibilities around what I call democratizing fashion. So what's brilliant about NFTs is if you are a digital designer and you create an NFT, you can have royalty fees programmed in. So every single time that garment is resold, you will get a cut of the profits. So it becomes a business model that can consistently sustain you. And, you know, we see it in the physical fashion world really taking off, you know, in the past four or five years, the idea of resale. And there's obviously also going to be digital fashion resale, and you can benefit from that resale of your product. You can also have far more protection around your intellectual property because you can show that you were the first person to create something. And finally, this idea of fractionalization also goes back to the creative process. So there are certain companies which are developing fashion garments where multiple designers on blockchain can input into the creation. So if you look at the kimono I'm wearing, one person could have made this lovely tiger print, one person could have made the shape of it, one person could have selected the color. And as the entire physical garment is sold as an NFT, proportional fees will go to all of those people. So they're, co they're correctly um, paid for their work. And first of all, this is so exciting because it adds to equity, but it also incentivizes people to collaborate in ways that they're not necessarily encouraged to in the physical fashion world, which I think is really exciting. Indeed. We are heading our five plus minutes, but I believe we have time for one question for our Q&A. I first would like to congratulate the participants, the questions or and the audience, because the answers from you are amazing and the questions from the audience are very, very intriguing. And a few, I believe we are not able to answer right now, but probably we are going to answer in a, in a further moment. I'd like to, uh, to write a few articles about these questions. But <laughs> okay. absolutely amazing. But there is one question that I believe we, we can end up the discussion with that. Um, Every is here asking us about, Leslie mentioned that only in the UK each year around uh, 5,000 uh, fashion graduates enter the workforce of our, our industry. If new digital skills are, of course, needed, especially to explore and make a living in the metaverse, how do you see these graduates survive to the skills they have gathered during their studies? And will they have a chance to upgrade their skills? And if yes, will it be enough to add value to their CV? Oh, can I answer that? Yes. Can I start? Well, my main advice would be to um, join the digital fashion group's next course. Of course. <laughs> I mean, really, every you handed that to me. Um, I, many universities are um, having digital skills um, teaching within their courses. Um, however, I do know that Clo, for example, is the largest supplier of um, uh, digital software to education in Europe, and they have 71 uh, clients within Europe. So there's, there must be at least 400 fashion design degrees within Europe. So there's still a long way to go. And one of the things that I see is that Although there are, is training in Clo or Browseware or whatever, it's on quite a basic level. And that normally the student has to be responsible for learning these softwares and these skills by themselves, for themselves. And there's not a training to really know what to do with the skills once you've got them. You know, how do you connect them with your practice in other ways? How do they connect to other parts of the industry, et cetera? And really that was the main reason that the digital fashion group was born. Um, so, yeah, I think that's uh, that's my answer to everybody. Anybody else got an answer? That's good. We covered it. There's so many questions here. We have to have time for answering some more of them. Yeah, I, I think answer. we can answer in a very uh, uh, in a short time. Yeah. This next question from Holly. What advice do you have for someone with a traditional fashion design, pattern cutting, uh, cutting and creative education in order to gain the skills needed for merging with the gaming industry or the metaverse? Of course, they have to do a digital fashion group course. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, Sean, maybe you would like to take this one. Uh, 
I, I was actually just preparing to answer another one, but, uh, but that's okay. <laughs> or uh, Danny, maybe Danny should take this yes. one. Away. Yeah, Danny, could you feel that? I mean, I, I would say take a digital fashion group course. Um, <laughs> I think what's really, really brilliant is there are a real wealth of resources out there which teach you essentially for free the basics of this. And there's this really vibrant community of digital designers. So I'd advise looking at the work of Steffi Fung. I also have a newsletter called The How What Why of Digital Fashion, which has at the end of it resources for digital designers. And also, um, I work very closely with the leading digital fashion house called The Fabricant. And they do Twitch streams where they digital they digitally design live. So I'd really, you know, it's so exceptional that now there is actually a course out there to train you in this and train you in the mindset because so many people have bootstrapped their way, you know, onto this through experimentation. And I still think that is a massive part of it. You know, I'm sure when you started actually designing physical fashion, there's a lot of it that's just trial and error. And it's starting there and it's really drawing on these community resources. And it's having this open-mindedness that you're not going to be perfect instantaneously and no one expects you to, but you can learn these new skills and train them for yourself. And they're going to be incredibly valuable. You know, I'll add in there, there's one, one thing that's very uh, different between old world designing and new world designing is um, you would hand sketch something put it into a tech pack and it would disappear for weeks on end and then something would come back which was completely wrong because something was misspelt, misunderstood, misread and then you have to start the process all over again before you get to there. The beauty of, of digital design is and now with you know top quality high class fast rendering you can technically and, and aesthetically review and revise things in, in minutes and you have the ability to be able to share that with, let's say, contributors or decision makers. So again, what you when I started in this world, you'd spend six months putting a season's collection together. Then you'd have to fly people in from all over the world to one location to do product presentations and salesman sample reviews and pricing meetings and all of this stuff. Literally, I could pick up a fabric, scan it, drop it into a jacket that already exists, send it to my sales director, send it to my sourcing director, give them a price of the material, and we could make a decision in, in seconds. And, and that would be looking at a beautiful render which draped properly, where the material physics was correct. And it's an easy decision process. Whereas in the past, people say, oh, I can't make a decision without touching it, or I need to see this in the, on, on a model before I can make a decision. There's no excuses for that in this world. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. If I, I, I just one of the questions, I know we'll, we'll maybe if I round up with a question, a, a little bit of the questions that I was looking at, and then probably we can uh, we can say goodbye, I think. But um, the, there's a, a, a couple of questions which involve elitism in uh, development and diversity, inclusivity, um, and you know the value of things, uh, of, of why people are buying or want to buy and cultural shifts and everything. I mean, I'm summarizing these, these few questions together, but one of the things that comes to me there is, yes, I think everybody has to be extremely careful in the metaverse of inclusivity, diversity, and elitism. It, it happens in society. It's going to happen in the metaverse. This is going to be a very interesting thing to see how that's dealt with and who deals with it and how they deal with it. Um, but on the other hand, I think in terms of spe specifically about the fact that understanding why people want and are engaged want to be and are engaged with a digital world and have digital personas and want to be in a metaverse for example um, this does relate to the gaming world world and people who game and have that experience and and but if we now look and step back and we talk generation z here in, in the question but actually i think we have to focus on generation alpha which is the next generation who are young people at the moment and, and learning and exploring and they have been engaged in this world almost from the moment they've been born. Um, and, and moving forward, the metaverse is going to become this, this alternative world for them uh, where they do have multiple digital persona um, and where they can do many things. Um, and for these people, well, not for these people, for Generation Z already, the value of having a digital 
sneaker or a digital asset or a digital Gucci bag or whatever it is, um, and having that NFT connected to it and being able to, to see this, buy this, trade with this through platforms like BNB, Richard's platform, um, this is this is something that everybody's engaged with now, and that will only grow and grow and grow. People want it. People are engaged with it. It is huge business, uh, not only just in, in you know, buying things to wear for your augmented reality self or your virtual reality self, but to bring it into the games, for example, um, and then to trade within the games. And so you're not stuck with looking how somebody wants you to look like a Viking in a game, for example, well, you're not stuck with it anymore because you can decide that you're going to, to wear Louis Vuitton uh, or whatever it is that, in that game and, and be very individual and different. And I think this is a key point that perhaps many of us who, who I, I would say, not involved in the gaming world, including myself, only on the outside, don't understand. I think until you really research and investigate, that's when you understand what this means to people. Um, and it, it's a, it is a cultural shift in many ways. Yes, just to also add to that. So I'm actually about to embark on a quite detailed piece of research with some really exciting partners around the significance of fashion in games and in the metaverse. So, you know, how are they signifiers of identity? How do they relate back to culture? and really deep dive and dig into that. So I'm very excited about that. But I thought, um, Leah, the question you asked is very, very important around this idea of elitism. And one of the most exciting possibilities that I have always seen for digital fashion is to democratize fashion. So being able to wear a dress for 30 or $40 or own it that you would never be able to wear or afford in the physical world. And I think what you've seen with the NFT boom is this absolute spiraling of prices. You know, one of my favorite digital brands, I used to originally buy stuff from them for $40, they're now $400. And I think partially that's because the price mechanics are really trying to even out. On the one hand, what you have is the value of these goods, they still have so much time and so much craftsmanship and they need to be priced accordingly. But then they also need to be perceived as a way to broaden fashion, allow people in countries who'd never be able to access fashion or indeed showcase their designs to have this accessibility. But obviously still pricing people's work correctly. So, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, Gucci had a $12 AR shoe. And in my opinion, that really lowballed the rest of the industry because if Gucci, a company that sells their physical shoes for hundreds of dollars, is selling an AR shoe for $12 and they can do that because they have a team of developers and they have a large enough community that enough people buy the $12 shoes. Then a digital designer who spent months creating the shoe and is trying to sell it for $40, they no longer have a place. So I think that's going to even out, but I really think digital fashion is a route to democratization in terms of who can show their collections, but also who can wear the designs. And so, the general community and the gaming community especially are far more interested in identity than elitism and even the kind of elitism and flex that's associated with in-game challenges far more than physical money and it's used to buy clothes and so i really think that is a central focus point of the community and i work quite hard to and i think a lot of other people in the space work quite hard to ensure that it doesn't, digital fashion doesn't become elitist. It allows for varied expressions of identity in a way that's democratic. Absolutely. And as Richard said, we are still in the beginning, at the beginning of it. And of course, the issues we had on physical fashion, we're going to carry with us, unfortunately, for the metaverse. It's a question of continuing this discussion and evolving this kind of discussion to avoid these main issues to go with us. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Sean. It was a lovely one hour and so fast. So Cheers, fun. Richard. Thank you very much. <laughs> a glass of wine from Richard. Oh. It's, it's 10 o'clock on Friday night. I think I, I'm allowed. It's 9 o'clock, wherever you are. Yeah, I say, thank, you thank you to our audience. I hope you learn a lot about the metaverse as much as all, we, all of us, we did it today. So see you all in Digital Fashion 101, I hope. Um, if you have any questions, any further questions, please keep in touch. We have our, our channels. We are always available. And see you all soon. And have a great weekend. Be sure starting before us. Bye. <laughs> Thank Thanks you, everyone. everyone. Bye, bye. 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 bye.